Check. Before we go any further, have a look at this. It's a very simple device, but it does very strange things to vegetables. What do you think it is? It's really a potato corer with a difference. Let me show you. You can see it's got a spike on the end. That gets driven into a potato or any other vegetable. And then you come across a spiral wire which acts rather like a drill. So as I twist it around like that, it's drilling into the potato. Now the ring hits and the fun really starts. There's a moment of tremendous apprehension while we can't see what's happening, but it's coming out the other side. And as it comes, you'll see that what it's done is to cut a perfect spiral. Well, here's the moment of truth. Let me pull it back and unscrew the core. And yes, here it comes, miles of it. And it's probably the most elegant potato chip you're ever going to see. Deep fry that and you've got a chip in a million. You can see it's actually a potato spring. Here we are, like that. And the crisper the vegetable, the better it goes. Let's try a carrot. In through that end. Once again, twist it in. You can hear it drilling its way through the carrot. And when we get to the other end, lo and behold, we've got a carrot spiral. And there we have it. A wonderful spiral carrot would grace any salad. Now, whether you want a crisp vegetable or a chip with a twist, you've got something that peels vegetables from the inside. Dean. Well, twisted vegetables are fascinating, but on reflection, I think mirrors are just as interesting. Look at these. Two mirrors, two reflections. Do you think it would ever be possible, using just two mirrors, to get more than two images? Well, of course it would, provided you bring those two mirrors closer together. Have a look at this. I'll take a matchbox and put it between the two mirrors. And right now you can see just two reflections, one in each mirror. But if I angle those mirrors around closer to one another, we now see four reflections as well as the original matchbox. And if I bring them even closer together, and if I tuck the matchbox right back there in the corner, you can see the original box plus one, two, three, four, five, six, or parts of six reflections. But that's about the limit with those mirrors. However, you get interesting things happening if you get two straight mirrors and put them almost parallel with one another. The sort of thing that happens sometimes in a barber shop or a hairdresser's shop. Look at this. We have a sort of tunnel of images looking all the way down there. Lots and lots of them getting dimmer as they recede into the distance. It's difficult to count them, but if you have something bright, it helps. Let's take this candle flame. I'll now put that in the position between the two mirrors. Light travels in straight lines, backwards and forwards between the mirrors. How many images can you see? I can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 images. Why don't you take two mirrors and a candle flame and see if you can get more than 20 images. <laughs> Rob will show you his new design for the human brain and I'll show you my device for seeing around corners, so stay with us.
Now this is the new improved version of the human head. The old one can't work properly. You see, the ears are in the right place, but the eyes are at the wrong end of the head. They're back here. They should be there. Let me show you what I mean. I'll get rid of these first. It makes talking easier. Inside the human skull, that's a real one, I've got a model human brain. And if I haul that out, you can see that it's not just a bag of porridge in there. It's all sorts of intricate bits and pieces. I'll turn it around. That's the front and that's the back. This part, for example, controls things like the heart and breathing. It's very important. A lot of this controls the way we feel about things, our moods and emotions. That controls a lot of our bodily movements. But it's this part on top that we're particularly interested in when it comes to things like hearing, seeing, tasting and smelling. It's the part that's really responsible for conscious sensation. Well, if I turn that round now, we've got the front here and the back there. And you can see the ears would be lying about there. Well, the ears send their message up to about there. That's the centre for hearing. And all of these sensations are really a correspondence between ears and brain, eyes and brain, mouth and brain, and so forth. But the eyes sitting here have to send their messages through a very convoluted pathway through the middle of the brain up to the back part there, really the back point of the skull. And if you're unlucky enough to fall over and bang the back of your head on some concrete or something, you might see stars because you jar that part of the brain. And it uh, registers activity, which tells the brain that really it's seeing something in the eyes. It's an illusion. Well, smell's a bit odd, but uh, touch, things like sensation through the fingers, heat and cold, etc., involves a part of the brain running more or less from ear to ear across the middle. But, uh, and taste in there too. But this part of the brain doesn't just deal with sensation. It deals with lots of things which we're conscious of. We do a lot of thinking in there, for example, and we do the instigation of some of our movements. For example, if I deliberately point a finger or kick a leg, we involve a part of the brain in front of the part involved with sensation. And just about there, there's a very important centre indeed. It's the centre for speech. It allows us to turn our thoughts into words. And if you know some very old people who've had a stroke, they've burst a blood vessel, and it can damage part of the brain here. If it damages that region, they have trouble speaking. They don't have trouble thinking, they just can't easily put their thoughts into words. <laughs> Who is it? This Austrian doctor revolutionised ideas on how the human mind works. He established the theory that our unconscious mind controls much of our behaviour. His theories brought new approaches to education, child rearing and sociology. He's the father of modern psychology. Many people in Western society view human behaviour at least partially in Freudian terms. He was Sigmund Freud. Light travels through clear things such as air, water, glass in straight lines but sometimes it does funny things on the way through. I'm looking at you, you're looking at me through an aquarium filled with water. Where do you think my nose is? Well you probably think it's directly below my finger now, right? Okay, keep that in mind and I'll raise my head and you find that my nose is over here. You were that far out. Why? Because the light coming from my face to your eyes was actually bent when it went from water and glass to the air. That's called refraction. One of the interesting things that light does as it passes through clear things. Here's something else that uh, light does as it passes through clear things. Now you're looking at a candle flame through the aquarium, through the water and the glass. Now I can move it backwards and forwards and you may notice something interesting up above that candle flame, about where my finger is. What can you see there? Yes, you can see a reflection of the candle flame because what's happening here is the light coming from the candle flame is actually bouncing off the undersurface of the water. So the surface of the water inside is acting as almost a perfect mirror. That's called internal reflection and it's very important. Look at this ornament that you saw a little earlier. Those little tubes are actually tubes of glass, cylinders. They act very much like a cylinder of water or a cylinder of solid glass. Water does interesting things passing through cylinders. Take a cardboard cylinder. If I take a little ball of plasticine and let it enter one end, it'll almost certainly come out the other. If I roll it through, or if I throw it through so it doesn't hit the sides, or if I make it bounce through so that it bounces backwards and forwards. Whatever you put in there will come out there. Same sort of thing happens with an optical fibre or a tube of glass. The light in this case is going into those little tubes of glass in the centre and then it's being taken to the ends 
of the optical fibres as little spots of light. Whatever colour it was in the centre, you see those little specks of colour on the end. You might say, well, that's fascinating, but does it have any use? And how long has it been around? Optical fibres have been around for thousands of years. Not those, but these. This is a, a mineral found in deserts in Southern California. It's called eulexite. Looks like a little piece of rock, doesn't it? A whitish colour. But have a look at this interesting property. If I put it over the top of the matchbox, you can actually see through the rock. You can see the image. And in fact, it's a bundle of optical fibres. It's nature's optical fibres. Thousands and thousands of little parallel tubes of clear rock that enable you to see that image. You can even read writing through it as well. Sometimes it's called TV stone because you see an image at the end of it. What about today? How are optical fibres used? I'm glad you asked. Have a look at this big cable drum. It has 500 metres of a very special cable on it. And you guessed it, the cable is a little tube of glass right in the centre. One little tube of glass. Most of it, most of the black stuff and the blue stuff, is plastic protective covering. That is worth tens of thousands of dollars, but it takes a very pure image, video image, from a camera to a video recorder, which may be up to half a kilometre away. And here's another very important use of optical fibres. This device is called a laparoscope, and doctors can use that to find out what's happening inside the abdomen. Small incision is made just near the navel, that's poked in, and the doctor can see what's happening. The only trouble is, Sometimes it's very difficult to see because there's no light inside. Here's where the optical fibres come in. This is a bundle of optical fibres. If you look at the end there, you may not be able to see them, but there are dozens and dozens of little optical fibres. And if I put the other end near the lamp, you can see what happens. It's almost as if a light switches on. So what the doctor does is connect one end of this bundle to the laparoscope. That goes in. The other end goes near a light source, special light source, and the doctor can see what's happening inside the abdomen. Here's a videotape which is showing what's happening inside a pregnant woman. You can actually see parts of the ovary, fallopian tubes, and uterus. So optical fibres, fibre optics, enable us to find out lots of things about what's going on inside and also to help us to communicate more effectively with people outside. Next, the inside story on how opals give us their colours, and we'll see an unusual way of preserving ancient myths and legends. I'd show you Mad Romanian woman With sexy on her hands Mad Romanian woman With Bubbles are very beautiful things. They have all the colours of the rainbow in them and so do oil films on puddles. And this sort of stuff that you buy to stick on your bicycle or your car reflects the colours of the rainbow too, as do precious opals, like these. And all of them reflect these rainbow colours for the same sort of reason. They all depend on white light. You see, if you take a beam of white light, hidden inside that are all the colours of the rainbow. A red, orange, yellow, green, blue and violet. When you mix them all up, you get white light but there's a way of unmixing them too. What about the wiggly stuff? Well, that depends on the wavelength of light. You see, if you take a skipping rope or any sort of cord like this and you jiggle one end while the other's tied, you'll notice that it gets beats in it, hills and valleys, and they tend to stay in much the same sort of place. It goes up and down and up and down. That really is the wavelength of a particular rope that you've got, and light travels in similar sorts of ways, and each color has its own wavelength. The wavelength is really the distance from the top of one hill to the top of the next. And you notice it's a big distance for red, it's a long wavelength, it's a short distance for blue and purple, and it's a medium distance for green. So when you get those wavelengths coming out, you get that particular kind of colour. Well, all of these things that we've seen produce colours in that kind of way. Let's say that's a bubble film, the side of a bubble film. When light 
comes through that, white light anyway, it reflects first from one side, the outer side of the film, and then from the inner side. But because the distance of the film, distance across it, is really only the same distance as the wavelength of the colours, that's what you get back. If it's a thin film, you get purple. If it's thick, you'll get red. The same with an oil film. It's only about as thick as the wavelength is the color of the colours. This stuff has very tiny lines scratched in the mirror surface, and in fact, the distance between the lines is about the distance of the wavelength of the colours that you see bouncing back. What about opal? Same sort of thing. You see, opal is really made up of little silicon spheres. They're rather like glass, a bit like tiny, tiny marbles. But if you have all of these of different sizes, like the ones in my hand, and cram them together, you'll notice that they go in in no particular order. It's just a, a mash of silicon spheres. And they don't bounce back light in any particular way. And that will give you opal, but it's opal without colour. It's potch or, or rough opal. But if those spheres are all the same size as they are in this model here, you'll notice that they pack into regular layers. There's one, two, three, four, five, etc. And lo and behold, the distance between them in precious opal is about the distance of the wavelength of light. So if they're big spheres, you'll get red light coming out. Little spheres, you'll get purple. And medium-sized spheres will give you rock like this, full of greens. Well, that's not all you have in opal. You also have water sitting inside the structure. It's not loose like this, otherwise it would flow out of the rock, but it is bound in there. And in precious opal, you've got about three or 10, somewhere between three and 10% of water. Well, some people think opal is an unlucky stone. It's not really true, but no one quite knows the origin. It may be because some opals tend to crack. And this is one of the reasons you look at any opal you buy very carefully. See, both of those look like very good opals. Indeed, they are. One is better than the other. If you hold this one up to the light, you'll see that inside it are some little whitish specks. They're known as cottons. And they're organic, and they can grow. If you magnify them a lot, they'd look like this, little black lines throughout the opal. And if they grow, they can split the opal and make it crack or break. So if you buy an opal, a precious opal like this that you can see through, hold it to the light, and if it's like this one, completely free of any cottons, it's not going to be an opal that cracks. So opal's not unlucky. It's like any gemstone. You can get good ones and bad ones. But nothing has the particular beautiful rainbow appeal of opal. How do you send a message to another person? Write a letter, take a photograph and send it, leave a note on the fridge, draw a picture? I guess we use all of those methods, don't we? Well, the Australian Aborigines years ago in Australia didn't have those methods, but they did have information to pass on from one generation to the next. And what they used to do was to tell stories around the campfire. That was their most important method of communicating to the next generation. They also did make paintings and carvings on rock walls. Those were really a bit like the notes on the fridge, but the main means of communicating down through the generations was the story around the campfire. Well, there was always a danger without a written language that some of those myths and legends could be lost. And so some people, with that concern in mind, thought of methods of preserving those myths and legends. One way, of course, is by making paintings. Ainsley Roberts made many famous paintings about the Aboriginal myths and legends. Another way is to put together little scenes, three-dimensional scenes or dioramas. And here are some of them at the Diorama Village in Alice Springs. Each scene tells a story. Some Aborigines believe that many years ago the spirit of the waterhole ate some people for washing in the water and polluting it. 
For this reason, they will only use water holes today for drinking purposes. Some Aborigines believe that Gulungaya, the spirit woman, walked through the bush at night, so they always stay close to the campfire when it's dark. And around one particular campfire many years ago, there was a great fight between two tribes. Those who were killed were thrown up into the sky where they became the stars of the Milky Way. Now water is often hard to find in Central Australia. Aborigines believe that the spirit people in the rocks called on a creature called Euroman to look for water for the tribes. When searching for water today, some people will look for strange marks on the ground, the tracks of Euroman. The Aborigines believe that the largest frog in the world was Tiddalik. After a long journey, he was so thirsty that he drank all the water in Central Australia, turning it into a desert. Sounds absurd, but in fact, there is a way. Curiosity. Rob, here's a full box of matches. Tip right. them all out on the table. Yes, it is full. OK, there they go. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to do some guessing in a moment, but I'll close my eyes at this point, and I want you to take any number and put them back in the tray, but make it over ten, just to make it a little bit more all difficult right. for me. Well, any you number turn to one side and keep I'm not looking. Coming. I have my eyes okay. closed and oh, my hand over my count eyes. Count them out. That looks... Now, the people out. at home are trying to find out how many you are putting in, but if you can let them know somehow or other... I shall. OK, mm -hmm. well, I know. You keep your eyes covered. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell them, because you'd hear, but I will show them that I am putting into that box exactly this number of matches. OK. Now, I guess it's a two-digit number. It is. Add the two digits together. All right. The first one's that, the second one's that. Put them together, I get that. All right. Now, take that number of matchsticks out of the box. Oh, OK. Well, here we go. That's, um... Don't you listen? No, no, no. I'm not listening at all. I don't know which and, way you're going. Uh, yeah. There we are. OK. Now, you have a new number of matchsticks in your yes, box. Yes, I do. Do you know what it is? Do they I know do. at home? They okay. do, indeed. Put the, put the cover back on the tray now. All right. And then cover over all the spare matches, That's wherever done. they happen to be. I'm going to open my eyes and amaze you with my mind-reading ability. All I'll do is pick up the matchbox and you have 18 matchsticks in there. <laughs> you must have been looking. <laughs> I didn't peek. Well, how did you do it? We'll be back a little later to show you how. Well, you guessed 18 matches. Does it always come out to 18? Not always, but quite often. Choose another number. Well, 35? If you'd chosen 35, you would have then said 3 plus 5. 8. 8 from 35. Uh, 27. OK, so very often 27 comes up and very often 18 comes up. What do you notice about those two? Well, they're multiples of 9. They certainly are. And you'll always get one of the numbers from your 9 times table. 9, 18, 27. 36 or 45. In right. fact, if you start with a full box of matches, you'll end up with just one of those five possibilities mm. by following that procedure. And it's fairly easy to tell if there are only nine matches in there. Listen. Almost empty. Right. And listen to 45. Almost full. Almost full. These take a little more practice to distinguish, but you can actually tell the difference between 
an 18, pretty empty, a 27, not so empty, and a 36. <laughs> they are actually slightly different in weight too, so with a bit of practice, you'll be able to try that on your friends. That's all for today's Curiosity Show. Goodbye. Curiosity. No.